team from Terminal Love that's screening at this year's 2019 Open World Toronto Film Festival. Just wanted to ask you guys a bunch of questions, but before we get into that, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Sina Dolati, the uh, writer and director uh, behind Terminal Love. I'm Kayla Jo Ferris, and I play the girl. I'm Yash Kenny, and I worked on visual effects. Can you tell us a little bit about what the film is about? Sure, yeah. Um, so it's a very simple scenario that I felt a lot of you know, young people go through, um, especially these days when they meet someone on a dating app. And uh, you know, a part of that relationship takes place on uh, you know, the, whole, the whole online world and texting. And uh, sometimes that relationship means more to one person than it means to the other. You get ghosted and you don't know what's going on with the other person. And there is this whole kind of manifestation of what that relationship could be in one person's uh, mind. So that's where the dark comedy aspect and the twist ending of the film comes from. It's kind of a representation of uh, that almost, you know, the, the insecurity that's built in the character of the boy uh, through how their relationship panned out. Do you guys and have any? Is there anything uh, in particular that inspired you to write that story? Um, I mean, like a lot of you know, young people have been through you know, that kind of scenario. I was actually in that very specific situation of um, meeting someone and uh, the barista is like, we're closing in 10 minutes. I'm like, oh shit, I got to <laughs> <laughs> go through this. Uh, but it's funny because when, when it happened, even though I was in kind of a not so great situation. I was like, oh, this would be a really good script scenario. So I wanted to get out of there and write, <laughs> write a script about it. <laughs> and then what would you say drew the two of you to the project? I think working with, with Sina. Um, I remember my initial audition was a self-tape. Um, and then from there, there was a callback uh, and a chemistry read. And I remember Sina just being like, I don't want you to worry about the lines. I just want you to focus on your motivation and just playing with the other character and just like truly connecting. So it was very open um, to it being a collaborative process, which um, is always great for, for an actor when you get to be part of something like that. So. Yeah, I think for myself, um, Sina really spoke to some pretty beautiful visuals that, without giving too much away, <laughs> really drew me to the project of both in a sort of like pseudo-realistic sense and then a hyper-realistic sense that um, hopefully you'll see at, the, see at the end, but overall just collaborating and working on m making, uh, like workshopping a look for some of the scenes was something really fulfilling and that sort of creative back and forth isn't something that you get too much in visual effects. I was really happy to explore that. You guys killed it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm really excited to see the film. Thank you so much, guys, for Thank answering you. some questions. Terminal Love is screening at the Open World Toronto Film Festival. today. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to day two of the Open World Toronto Film Festival. My name is Alina Christensen. I'm going to be your host for the day. So I do want to kick things off and get right into our first screening. Um, as well, if you're taking any pictures um, or if you want to like tweet about a film that you saw, make sure to use the hashtag, um, hashtag OWTFF, and tag us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at OWTFF, so give us some social media love. Um, so our first film of the day is a Canadian short, and it is called Terminal Love. It's written, directed, and produced, as well as edited by Sina Dolati. Terminal Love is featured in the local support category of OWTFF, and afterwards we are lucky enough to be having a Q&A, because we'll be joined by the filmmaking team. On a cold night in Toronto, two days before Christmas, a young boy and a girl who have recently started dating meet for a seemingly normal coffee date. However, they soon found out, find out that it may well be their very last. 500 Days of Summer meets Tarantino in Terminal Love, a dark romantic comedy fueled by surreal 
uh, dark roman <laughs> sorry, dark romantic comedy fueled by surreal aesthetics and a musical story world. The story explores relationships between young couples in the modern age of technology and smartphones where online personas, social media, and the fear of getting ghosted leads to an endless loop of fictitious disconnect, insecurity, and paranoia. Enjoy the film. up here to answer some questions. <laughs> Dating is so weird. <laughs> um, I'll give you guys a mic so you can each introduce yourselves. I'm Sino Doadi, the writer-director of the film. Uh, I'm Yash Kinney, I did visual effects for the film. Hi, I'm Kayla Jo Ferris, and I play the girl. Awesome. So I'm going to start with a question for you, Sina. Um, I think we can all relate to at least one moment in that film. Was there anything in particular that inspired you to tell this story? Uh, yeah, I, the, the kind of situation that they're in is you know, something that a lot of young people go through at a certain stage, especially like these days when you meet someone on an app. There is a, a big part of that relationship that happens through texting or online. And there is this kind of disconnect that, you know, the relationship means something to one person um, and means more to that person and it's just com something completely different in the um, mind of the other person. And, uh, you know, I had my fair share of that. And, um, you know, this film was kind of a way for me to kind of express that insecurity. And um, the ending is almost like a, a manifestation of this, like, childish uh, mentality of, like, all right, if, if this person doesn't want me, you know, life can end kind of a thing. So it was a way to kind of manifest that and just have a laugh at it. Um, and, uh, you know, life goes on, almost, sort of. And, uh, yeah. Cool. Does anyone from the audience have any questions? Uh, no, it was, uh, I was at school when we shot the film, so I leveraged uh, some of that um, resources. The rest of it was uh, just uh, some cost for labor, um, getting the crew together that was self-funded. And uh, it took two main shooting days and uh, a few half days for the B-rolls of the boy in the apartment. I knew Josh from, uh, we went to U of T together, and uh, Kayla, I knew that, know each other. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I self-taped for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have any uh, upcoming projects? Um, I've been, this year I've been kind of taking it slow, did some music videos, but in terms of narratives, I've been writing a lot. Uh, just uh, some small shorts that I've been working on. Yeah. Uh, I was actually in a TV show called Witches of Salem that um, just aired in October for uh, the Halloween season, and uh, a couple of shorts that will be coming out hopefully soon. Did you rehearse your actors? Uh, yeah, we did some. Uh, we did a chemistry. We had some rehearsals. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so. I, I self taped for Cena, and then he had me come in for a chemistry read with uh, Rio, who plays the boy. Um, and then from there, I think we had one more rehearsal day where we kind of just played. Um, and Cena just kind of emphasized that he didn't necessarily want us to stick straight to the script, um, and that we had the ability to kind of just play within what he provided for us, kind of thing, uh, which was a really nice experience. So we kind of got to shape all that out before we got on the set. Yeah, and uh, I kind of really wanted the dialogue to come off naturalistic, so a lot of that was uh, inspired by what happened in the rehearsals. Uh, we kind of had the scenarios written down for the actors of like their actual first date, which we didn't see in the movie, just to you know develop the chemistry between them. Um, and I think it paid off uh, because he 
each shot was only one or two takes. Right. That was actually my next question. What are you inspired um, for writing your scripts? And uh, inspired? Um, I mean, this one, I find that when there's like some sort of uh, lived experience, it always makes for the best scripts. Um, obviously, the situation was very common, uh, you know, but the ending, the twist of it was some, the thing that I think kind of makes it a little more unique. Um, and uh, wh whoever I showed the script, it was like, what the hell? <laughs> what happened? Because in the script, it's just one line, right? Robbers come in, the couple gets shot, and, <laughs> and you can't really visualize it. Yeah, it's a big question for you on that. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Question over there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, technically, the film was in person, good as an angel, good photography. But I have a little bit of feeling about the uh, script, uh, the ending. I'm the first director to you. Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I have been away from Canada for about 17 years, living in abroad, and I've come back to Toronto, I'm Torontonian. So I don't know how, the, they probably the, the, you were based in Toronto, right? Uh, yeah, probably. So, I mean, I don't know whether the trend with, with today is Toronto, but, you know, uh, typically I'm talking about the theoretical level, the role of cinema. You know, uh, this is what represents this reality, the principle of fantasy at the end. Uh, you know, we can see reality in the screen. I think that the cinema should uh, uh, give people hope, uh, and I don't see that in this film. I don't have to go to a cinema to see what's going on in the streets, right? Don't you think that with a bit different ending, you can make this film? Uh, well, they, uh, they met, and you know that final shot is almost like the afterlife, or uh, you know they actually do end up together, but it is in the boy's mind and how, what this relationship was to him. So uh, even though it is presented in the format of a very, you know, kind of a twisted dark comedy, the, the idea behind it is that, you know, life actually does go on. And uh, this 10 minute uh, encounter they have is not your last relationship. So that's what I tried to do, I mean. Uh, well, yeah. uh, good, good message, but uh I think that maybe if you could add another two minutes to it somehow to clear, make it like clear. Sure. <laughs> He's not a fan of the mystery, no, I, I guess. <laughs> know in terms of um, having like a hopeful outlook I think that that's what comedy does a lot of the time because life isn't always easy and things don't always go our way but then we can watch films or listen to music and you know we have we see that that truth told through humor which brings joy right so that's one way of looking at it as well um, next up we have another short film this one comes to us from the United States Kyle B. Thompson is the writer, producer, and director of The Boy Hero. Actor Jeffrey Benson is the winner of the Best Supporting Actor Award at the festival for the role of Max. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> the Boy Hero is a narrative short film that raises awareness of childhood cancer. Excuse me. Um, and tells the story of an unlikely friendship that forms over an art project. Max is determined to earn his superhero pin, so he enlists the help of 75-year-old Frank, played by Mike Callahan, to help him as they both go through chemotherapy. Afterwards, we are lucky enough to once again have a Q&A with the team. Please enjoy the film. Could I please have the team from the boy hero to the stage? <laughs> I'm gonna give 
give you a microphone as well. What a touching, heartfelt film. Um, I guess I want to start by, um, first I'll let you, both of you introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Benson and I play Max. <laughs> Hi, I'm Z. Joseph Geis. I'm the executive producer on the film. Um, I'll start with um, what was the inspiration or motivation to, to create a, a film like this with this subject matter? Um, Kyle B. Thompson, who uh, wrote and directed the film, and he sends his regards. He just had a, uh, a baby, so it's sort of he's having to say at home. <laughs> do some fatherly things, but uh, he saw a post on, um, are you familiar, Humans of New York, are you familiar with that at all, it's an Instagram, sort of Facebook, yes. um, and it was a, a post about a single mother who had a, a child with cancer, and um, he was moved by, by reading this post and, and, and thought about that situation and, and what a struggle it must be for her. And, um, and that's sort of the germ that, you know, that, that planted the seed to, to make the film. And the first, um, the first draft was more of the mom's story. And as he reworked it, it sort of became about the friendship between the, the patients. Hmm. Does anyone from the audience have any questions about the film? Mm -hmm. We shot it uh, four days, um, over four days, in uh, Brownsville, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh. Um, one of our producers, Rolando Hernandez, got a, a lead on a, an abandoned hospital. And we were able to just sort of go in there and they had everything we needed, and so four days. And I think we have a question over here. Okay. I was wondering, because um, you are the It was Kyle. Um, he got the idea. He wrote the script. I had worked with him before as as an actor, um, and I had started making my own films on the side. And he saw that. Uh, and when he got ready to when it, when he got a script ready, he gave me a call and he said, "Hey, I see you're making your own films now. Do you want to come on board as a as a producer and help me do this next thing?" So that's kind of. film has resonated um, you know we've played we've played a lot of a lot of places uh, we did have one outlet uh, for streaming reach out to us um, and we we've, we've made a note of it but we've uh, we're sort of doing the festival rounds right now and we're kind of focused on that and um, we do have a finish line in sight um, and we have, you know, so it's, we're, we're starting to think about platforms, you know, Amazon Prime, things like that, where we can, where we can get out, out to a larger audience. But, uh, um, yeah, we've okay. been pretty fortunate on the festival circuit so far. Yes, and thank you, Toronto Open World, for having us. Okay. Yeah. 
And it's not a direct question to the movie, but uh, um, we would all like to know, uh, when did you feel like you decided to become an actor, or is that something that... Uh, yeah, so when I was, I think it was about a year and a half ago, basically I I went to a talent show for my school, and I won first place, actually. I was a year younger than I was supposed to be in it, but my music teacher said, oh, you could, you have great talent, you should, you could be in it. And basically what, it, what, they, what the judges said afterwards is, is they came up to my mom and, they, and, my, and my dad, and they said, your son has great talent, he should either go into like theatrical acting or on stage acting, and, and then that, or the, theatrical acting and on camera acting, my bad. Um, and basically that's where it started from. Well, I think the judges were right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so basically, it's kind of a funny story. So when I was in my audition, our audition room, basically before we went in, we had me, my me, my dad, and my parents. We had a great conversation with Mike before, even beforehand, we went in. And so basically, we went in, and Mike went in, and they said, "Oh, you guys come back, and you can we see you both together again." And so we went to lunch, we came back, and we still had that same great connection that we had outside of the audition, and we just clicked. Yeah, and what you see on screen is pretty much, it was there. It was there immediately. Um, they had such a chemistry and such a rapport. Um, and they became their characters. Can I tell one funny story real quick? Of course. Um, the, last, the last day of uh, shooting, it was like, it was virtually like the last, the last shot was the, uh, the scene you see with the, the wheelchair. And, um, and it took a, a while to set up because uh, DP uh, Giuseppe had to, to mount the camera with Jeffrey in the chair oh, and yeah. facing him and Mike had to, to push it down the, uh, the hallway. And, and Giuseppe was really, he was an excellent DP and he, but he had certain marks that he wanted Mike to hit as Mike was pushing the chair. And so we did, I don't know, <laughs> Too many. Too many. <laughs> um, and it was the last shot, everybody knew it, and we're like, ah. Oh. So we kept having to restart them. And they had their, their lav mics on. And they had really become the characters, and Mike uh, started to, to mumble certain things. And Mike is excellent. He is, he is great. But he, he started to mumble, oh, again? How many more times? And finally, Jeffrey was like, uh, you know they can hear you, right? <laughs> and Mike was like, what? And he was like, your, your mic is on. <laughs> so that's kind of how this guy was. He was on top of everything. He, he, he knew it. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, well, on that note, thank you guys both so much for being here. We do really appreciate it, and it's so great to hear from you guys about what the experience was like and I think Jeffrey we are going to present you with your best supporting actor award <laughs> A Canadian web series we're gonna move into that and it's part of the special presentations category at the festival running with violet is a multi-season serialized drama sorry dramedy about two women and a toddler who find themselves um, descending further and further into the world of small town crime. It's directed by Joyce Wong, written by Rebecca Davey and Marie Claire Marcotte, who also produce and star in the series, and also produced by Trent Scherer, Paul O'Quinn, and Michael Chan. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
talked to you yesterday before your screening, and you were really excited. How did you feel about the screening today? What about you, Jeffrey? How did you feel the audience received there? Were you happy? Um, yeah, so for the second half of the evening, we're going to begin with our industry talk for the day. Best-selling fantasy author, artist, teacher, and lover of chocolate, Ms. Michelle Barrow Belisle, has always lived with one foot in the real world and one foot in the imaginary. So it follows that she would grow up to write about characters from the enchanting worlds she knows and loves so well. As a fan of romanticizing the mundane, Michelle's young adult novels are populated with scintillating witches, elves and fae, and her illustrated children's books reflect her otherworldly imaginings. Her best-selling debut series, Fire and Ice, The Fairy Song Saga, is currently in development for a major motion picture, which we'll be talking about today. So please join me in welcoming Michelle barrow Belisle and our monitor, Giselle Liu. always loved writing, kind of like what my, my bio describes. I've kind of always lived in this imaginary and fantasy world and um, got told that a lot by teachers to you know, get my head out of the clouds and have to work. Um, so the story that was optioned for film was my first um, book series and I started writing that when I was, when I was much younger and I was reading a book series to him and I very arrogantly thought, I think I could write something better. So I started writing it and then set it aside because I just got stuck and then I realized that I needed to age it up because it was for too young of an audience. And it was about the same time that um, Harry Potter and Twilight and all of those yeah. things had, you know, sort of, and teen, the teen genre in books and films were sort of exploding. I thought, okay, I think that's what's missing. It kind of needs to be for an older audience. So I kind of changed the plot, changed the characters, went that direction, and then kind of worked out. So what type of obstacles did you face when you were starting your career, and how did you overcome those ones? Well, I mean, there were obstacles to the writing mm -hmm. portion of it, um, trying to figure out how to make the story really gripping and compelling and something that wouldn't put people to sleep. And I sort of created these characters, and I thought, you know, I don't, I didn't want anything bad to happen to them because I really liked them, but of course you have to torture your characters, you have to make these difficult, you have to create um, obstacles and conflict and that sort of thing. So learning, it was a bit of a learning curve in really shaping the story into something that would be interesting to anybody other than me. Um, and then once the story was finished, of course there's the whole other obstacle of um, selling it, getting an agent and getting a, a publishing house to, to buy it. And then after that, part was done. I also, on my own, went out to look for a, um, a producer and sold the film option. Yeah. How did you find the producer? Um, I did a lot of social media networking. And it's, it's so funny because I started a course because I get asked that by authors all the time. And it was just sort of grassroots networking, conversations, talking to people, um, getting to a place where it was like, okay, you know, I've written this book. You know, if you're, would you be interested in taking a look at it? And he said yes. And he said, I probably will get back to you for six months or so because I'm completely swamped and I thought I'll probably never hear from you again. And I think it was like four or five days later, he said, I'm three chapters in and I already am feeling like, you know, we need to make this a movie. So it was pretty exciting. Yeah, I've done right now. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. In one other question, so you've also started a book to screen course. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what the course entails? 
Yeah, so that was, like, it's the number one question that I was getting asked by um, authors, and I love to share that information. But I feel like, you know, sometimes I get these friend requests on Facebook, and it's kind of like, hey, I'm an author, buy my book. And it, it's like, well, yeah, no, it doesn't really work like that. You can't just, you know, throw stuff into people's faces. You have to build and develop some kind of relationship, some sort of, you know, conversation and that sort of thing. So this course kind of takes authors through all the steps that I went through, um, including things like, you know, creating a log line and um, a treatment and, a, you know, being able to pitch their story um, effectively and then make those connections and that sort of thing. Yeah. So did you have any aha moments when you were doing and how did you think or recite your process from getting to this point? Oh, so many along the way, really. Um, like with the writing, I think a lot of the aha moments came earlier on when I was sort of, you know, in learning how to shape the story. But it's been really interesting the adaptation process of taking a story from book to, um, to, to yeah, yeah, like that's just been, and I'm not writing the script myself because, like, <laughs> that's just beyond my skill set at the moment. But I am co going to co write it. So it's a learning experience, just sort of, you know. You know, they said to me, okay, we have to take your 400-page book and <laughs> cut it down to 100 pages, <laughs> sort of. My jaw dropped. I thought, how on earth can we do that? And, you know, but that's the process. Right? Would you ever consider writing writing space, after screenplays in the future? Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear yeah. your question. Would you consider writing screenplays in the future? Yeah, for sure. So are you working on any new books or projects right now? Can you share anything? I am. I always have so many on the go. Yeah. Um, I'm working on a new series that I was actually in talks with a couple of um, uh, studios during TIFF for an adaptation perhaps into a TV series. So there's two, two books that have been already published in those series and then two more that I'm working on. Um, and then there's also the... Oh, fifth book in the, the Fairy Song Saga, which is my initial book series. It was supposed to be a trilogy originally, and now it's expanded into six books, so. Yeah, yeah. I thought that when I, when I had the idea for one, I honestly thought it was going to be one book, and that, yeah. was, that was it, and that's all I had in me. And now it's like, you know, Niagara Falls. It just keeps <laughs> coming. That's, yeah. that's amazing, that's really, really good. That's fun, yeah. There's also one more thing I want to ask you about is, you have a, Tell a, a passion, tell a summit series? That was, yeah, something that I, I'm not doing it currently, but um, a friend and I, we used to listen to a lot of um, tele summits. And I feel like mindset is a huge piece in, in all of this and in being successful and, yeah. and happy and all that sort of thing. So what we did is we put together our own, um, like, tele summit, basically, yeah. where we would interview all of our favorite speakers um, from, you know, all sorts of different different areas and presented that and then people could call in and ask questions and stuff and it was, it was really great. I think everybody got a lot out of it. How did you get into that part? Well, it was actually through a friend who she used to run um, these really sort of small group law of attraction type um, workshops and so it was through her and I've always had an interest in, in that sort of thing too, so yeah. Um, is there any questions from the audience? I think I saw your hand up earlier. I actually have a question. How did you find the law of attraction work help you in terms of, because I'm into that. So you? Yeah. before you even said what you were saying, I was thinking of the law of attraction and you said law of attraction. <laughs> See, there you go. So, <laughs> how, how did that manifest anything? Do you know what? I think for me, it's always kind of been there behind the yeah. scenes, but I never had a name or a label for it until The Secret. Of course, that was right. kind of like, you know, the thing that, that exploded it and then we had all the language to go with it. And since then I've been devouring everything okay. like that. Yeah, like I just find it fascinating. But did you find that um, in terms of aligning yourself in a certain way, because as soon as you said aligning, you said it's like, I know what you're talking about, I know what you're doing. So did you find that that really influenced the way things move? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Like in the, in the course, um, I have a line that says, Intention plus action equals magic, and I truly believe that because that's sort of how the way things have unfolded. You know, I sort of set my sights in a direction, but couldn't actually predict the way that it would happen. But it, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Jason, you had a question. Okay. Hello. 
yeah, when you first approached like the producers, like mm -hmm. saying like I have a book, were your book like already published or self published, or was that like more like a, a first draft or something like more like as a script? It was already published. It was very recently published. Um, the thing was that my neither my agent nor my publisher had um, sort of the proper connections to anybody in the, the film um, and entertainment industry to, to pitch it successfully. So I just sort of went out and, and did it myself. <laughs> because, like, this really needs to happen. I just sort of felt that was the, the direction I wanted things to go. Yeah. Do you see yourself writing also for adults? If you know, if you see yourself writing for kids and adults and teenagers and sort of hitting different markets? I do, yes. I currently write for like across <laughs> actually the whole age span. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Okay. Any advice you would give writers? To write. Like, like so many people say, I'd love to write a book. I would love to write a book. Okay. One day I'd love to, and then they don't okay. write a word. Yeah, it's like, write. <laughs> There's absolutely no barrier to it, just, you know, except for actually doing it. So yeah, that's kind of the best advice. Another question here. Uh, would you actually see yourself, like, uh, actually writing a screenplay and then directing it, like, to have, like, a vision more faithful to what you really have in mind? I would absolutely love to do that. And I've been very fortunate because the, um, the producer who optioned my first book series wants me very involved in the project and wants to keep it as close as possible to the original story, and that's not always the case, right? But, um, yeah, yeah. Hi, um, Hi, it's lovely to hear you speak. So what sort of themes do you focus on? Um, oh, a lot of Love Conquers All. <laughs> I think that, that was probably one that is um, threaded through all of my stories. Um, because there's always an element of, of romance in there, but there's also um, there's also the element of like you know self empowerment and the power of choice and the power of like that you have inside of you, and I think that's part of why I love writing fantasy because you can wrap that up really nicely in you know weave it into a story um, into any kind of quest or anything like that. Yeah, so I think those are definitely the most prevalent ones. Right. You write a lot of vampire, not vampire, but fantasy. So is there like another genre that you would like to explore? Because I know it's all it's mostly fantasy. But is there another type of stories that you would like to tell? I would love to write rom com, but I've been told I'm not very funny, so <laughs> I'm not sure if that's ever gonna happen. But I would love that. Um, Contemporary is difficult for me because I, I just get, you know, I start writing and then I feel like, yeah, I need to throw in some vampires or something because I get a little bit bored. But, Maybe yeah. a rock come with vampires. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Better than Twilight, though. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to kind of give us more of an idea of a breakdown of you know the steps that it takes to get your book um, like once it's published to get it onto a screen kind of like what are the steps that you've gone through and that you still have yet to to go through to make that process happen and come to fruition okay well I mean there's probably quite a few that I'm not familiar with because we haven't crossed those bridges yet but um, in terms of the book, I think there's a lot of, of crossovers. So, you know, like I wrote a summary for it, for example. And from what I'm understanding, it's very similar to a treatment. Um, so there's, and, and you have to write like a pitch line, which is, you know, a log line. So that aspect of it converts very nicely. Um, distilling something so large down into, you know, a 100 page script, for example. That is a part of the process that I'm, I'm still not sure I've wrapped my head around how that happens. I've read several scripts and um, I can sort of see the way, you know, like especially books that have been adapted already. And you look, I've read the original book and then you look at the script and you can sort of see how 
you know, they break it down and take the, the main themes. But as the author, you know, it's very difficult to sort of pull threads and it's like, okay, this is important and this isn't. And I was like, I feel like I did that when I was in the editing stage before it got published. I cut away all the stuff that I didn't need. So that part is, you know, a bit of a learning curve. And, um, yeah, and so, I mean, I've sat in with the, the producer on some of the meetings, like where they set the budget and they got the funding and, and that sort of thing. And there's so many moving pieces. Like, it's fascinating. Um, and, yeah, a lot more to come. Yeah. What is your favorite word as a writer? Oh. <laughs> wow. That's a really hard question for a writer to come up with. Just it one is word. Does it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the energy of the crowd is awesome too, so it should be good. 
This is the first uh, time for me seeing myself on screen with other people watching and doing a Q&A and all that kind of stuff. So it's nervous excitement, but uh, feeling good. <laughs> It was really fun working on this film, and Mark has like an incredible community that he's built of like different filmmakers and actors and stuff, so I'm very thankful to have been in it. Yeah. And thank you to everyone for being here. Yeah, yeah. this is really cool. Lots of sure. support, so I'm very happy about Excellent. that. Open World Toronto Film Festival, so being Steve, they're amazing, but the Open World Toronto Film Festival is amazing as well. Yes. Everybody loves to tell me that I was born in an old soul. Better keep my eyes wide open. There's so much that I don't know. Just another hotel room. Never felt so all alone. I think about my granddad's eyes, and they always send me home. I can almost hear him now. Gotta make him proud. I keep my eyes wide open. Bless this ground unbroken. I'm about to make my way. Heaven help me keep my faith, my eyes wide open. I can't see two steps ahead of me but when the fog comes rolling in. I never thought I'd miss the rain. Lord knows how long it's been. This dream burns inside of me, and I can't just let it go. There's still so much that I don't know. I keep my eyes wide open. Bless this ground. On Broken. I'm about to make my way. Heaven help me keep my faith, my eyes wide open. And all I have is just this moment. And I don't want to miss a second. Cause it could all be gone in an instant, yeah, in an instant. Keep my eyes wide open, broken. I'm about to make my way. Heaven help me keep my faith, my eyes. was a giant, tough and mean. David was a sweet heart, squeaky clean. 
but it still takes two to tell the story. So I play my part, and in all my glory, I'll fly like a raven in the sky of dust. I'll make you love to hate me, but that's still love, it's still love. Love is what I want, love is what I need, you see beneath this suit of armor, I still bleed, I still bleed. He used to hold me like a flower, kiss me oh so slow, and we talk about forever, but that was long ago. And now forever's just a place in someone else's story. And though my heart still breaks, I'm going to find my glory and fly like a raven in a sky of doves. I'll make you. But that's still love, it's still love. Love is what I want, love is what I need. You see beneath this suit of armor, I still bleed. So I'll fly like a raven in a special presentations category. Um, I think a lot of you might be familiar with this writer, director, producer of this film, Mark Datwin. <laughs> which centers around two characters, Maria and Milo, who have always had a peculiar mother-son relationship that had never really been questioned. That is, until one day, its limit is exercised. It is an examination of a tormented mother's attempt to reconcile her differences with her abusive son. Enjoy the film.
Stella Alejandro, Assistant Director. you do is you write what you know and sometimes you just have to sort of transpose it. It's a lot of stories are universal and uh, so while this is not directly about my mother and myself, it's far from it, uh, I have had a lot of experience with, um, well, I guess um, lack of closure I think is the biggest thing. And I, I feel like, I know that sounds something very simple, but I feel like that's something that I that I am struggling with um, because of that over the years. And uh, so what I want to do is um, sort of tie that into a relationship between mother and son. Um, and uh, so that's initially what inspired it. Um, what really brought it to the forefront though, uh, we had just uh, finished filming a, a movie called Oksana and Victor, and then Nick and I were kind of suffering from, so Nick was also the lead actor in that one. And so with uh, Katarina, who's in the audience, there she is, yeah, wonderful. Uh, well. Uh, and uh, so we're talking with Rala, as most filmmakers do, and I think it was like a week uh, after we shot that where I was feeling like, oh man, I really want to shoot something else. Uh, and I was going to New York the week after, and I think and I were thinking, we're working on something, like, you know, I'm going to write something in New York, like next week. And we did, and so because that was sort of the front of my mind, I ended up uh, writing this particular story. But, uh, but of course, everything, like when I do a drama, it's really rooted in like, all right, now I'm going to open it up to the audience. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask? Yes. Uh, hi, Mark. Thank you for the special presentation. wanted to know if you could talk a bit about the budget, because as a filmmaker myself, um, struggling artist, I like craft dinner and peanut butter, apparently. Um, so could you talk a bit about how much something like this would cost to produce? Uh, so this one here, uh, like I said, this was sort of a project that was born out of uh, us being sort of uh, bored or uh, just suffering from withdrawal. So this is definitely one of our lower end uh, productions. So everyone on here was a volunteer. So there was a very minimal budget. Um, everything basically went to, um, well, not even equip, uh, just a, a little bit for equipment, but not even for location. I mean, that whole setting was um, at my parents' house. And uh, we already had a permit for the park at Port Curtis. So uh, very minimal. So this one here uh, cost about $1,000. Not, not too much more than that. Um, and, uh, but this is an anomaly. So not every film that we make would 
trust is little. It's just something that everyone came on board who wanted to. I mean, it, like I've worked with a lot of these, uh, these these people many times, but uh, there are also some people that came on board, like Clinton Paula, for example, and Vlad, who uh, just came over because they wanted to work on something that was passionate, right? So the biggest thing for me is like I don't let uh, a budget uh, stop me from making something or any of us from making uh, what we love to do. Uh, so unfortunately, that's not probably the answer that you want to hear because it's not necessarily realistic. But uh, it, when you do have a team that's really passionate, you can really make put a story up on screen uh, for very little. Way in the back there. What brought your characters to their dark area, to that point in their life? What was the cause? Okay, well, how about I let, because, uh, so there was a lot of character development and a lot of, uh, well, we did have a rehearsal, but there's a lot of discussion, um, uh, because definitely um, Nick, Suzanne, and Joanna brought a lot to their characters, and a lot of it was because of discussion. So it's not necessarily what's on paper, but I'll let them speak to how they um, started the process and, and how it started from when they first initially read the script to uh, when we finally shot. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I think in terms of my character development, I just tried to uh, draw parallels between my life and Milo's life as much as possible, just to make the work uh, a little easier, more believable for me. Um, I think in, uh, in every parent-child relationship, there, not in everyone, but in most of them, there's a, there comes a time when uh, the relationship uh, begins to wilt. Maybe petals fall off slowly one by one, and um, sometimes it feels difficult to uh, to reroute whatever you have going on. Um, so, uh, specifically uh, with my mother, I guess I experienced something like that. Uh, it, obviously, it was never uh, to the point of that insanity. <laughs> uh, uh, but like Mark said, you write what you know, and uh, it's the same for acting. You act what you know. So just try to make it as personal as, personal as possible. Uh, yeah, that's it. Well, I'm, I'll talk a little bit more to the technical process. Um, I got just my sides, just actually the monologue, and was able to, to take a look at that, let it percolate, bring it to Mark in an audition tape, and then got a call back. And in the call back, it was working with Nick. And at that point, Mark then introduced the idea of it being an abusive relationship. So that shifted things a little. And so I was able to add a layer, bring a little bit more darkness into it, and then at the table read, I finally got to see the whole thing. And so we discussed what you know the possibilities are, but again, it's open-ended and it's up for your interpretation. Um, so that's why it's a bit of a fine balance as far as how much you can present and how dark you want to read into it. But I think you know the idea of the way Mark helped me sculpt the situation and the character uh, by adding layers was actually a great experience. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful way to develop a character. So. Uh, yeah, and my character, uh, the script I got and saw, I don't even think I ever saw the whole script. Um, so I basically kind of just like made up a story behind, you know, why is this guy being so cold and reserved and why doesn't he want to write anything in this Hard, so I kind of just had to make that up for myself. Yeah. And yeah. Huh. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you guys so much for being here. This is the team of Limited. Can we give them a round? Director Wojtek Zielinski's One Night Stand, starring Trish Rainoni and Matthew Sobey. 
So um, what starts out as a routine business trip leads to Travis, played by Sobe, making the greatest moral decision of his lifetime. Enjoy the film. <laughs> So I don't want him suing me after. <laughs> now I'd like to say only one thing that um, for many of you, you don't know behind the story of this film. So probably there will be another film making of, but not, uh, not what, what you think, like making of, like in the te technical part, but making of the film after the fact when the film was made. It's complicated, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you to Andrew Wright as well. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, he really helped out in a lot of ways here. And uh, so, yeah, we can begin the 45 minute question answer session. <laughs> Take it away. Does anybody have any questions in the audience? Well, I don't know if you noticed, yeah. probably you have, oh, yeah, that's it. Probably you have noticed uh, certain differences. Uh, it was in two scenes, it was me doubling for <laughs> Matt. Matt <laughs> is not supposed to get out. Yes. Okay. And uh, one of those scenes was, uh, sorry to say that it was the Long making scene. <laughs> Mark, if Matt couldn't do it, just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a miser trained actor, not a method, so. We're gonna bring in a professional for that one. Um, what else? What was I gonna say? But you know what? It was uh, really fun filming that. Ten days from now, but today's the eighth, correct? Right? I auditioned for this role, Trisha and I met 10 days, five years ago, 10 days from now, November 18th, which is crazy. So it's been a long road, and Trisha and I are good friends, Voitech, and it all started with Belushi's Toilet, too. It's just, it's amazing. You do jobs in this business, and you don't know where it's going to lead, and who you're connected to, and through Trisha, I met Mark, and it just spirals, you know, and it's just a beautiful thing when filmmakers get together in the same room. One thing I would like to add for uh, quite a few cinematographers that are here. Uh, this uh, quite a big part of the film was filmed 
not what you would think what it was. Like it was supposed to be filmed in the open air uh, during the night, but because of the rain, we ended up filming the entire the car scene inside this small garage. <laughs> Everything was uh, set up for the outdoor shoot, but we had to pack quickly and make up as we go. Oh, cool. And I think we have a question in the front. What inspired the story? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not the writer, so I don't know how to answer that. Um, <laughs> I hope it's not based on real life events. <laughs> I will say that. Um, but yeah, I apologize. I can't. I can't get in. I don't. I don't think I want to get into that guy's mind. Don't look at me. Or maybe can you give any insight into um, like what you did to prepare her, like from your character? Yeah. So what I what I what I love about this film is he's not necessarily... Yeah, he is a bad. Well, here's the thing: the, the light turns green at the end. And my background is policing, and if you're the last person to be seen with somebody alive, whether you like it or not, you are the first suspect. You're not leaving town, he has a daughter. So it's a moral dilemma. He, he is a, like a narcissist in that sense that he's even considering fleeing, right? And going back to his life, I mean, but other than that, it's, he's not the killer, but at the same time, he might as well be because He's leaving somebody's sister, daughter, you know what I mean? So there's that. But that being said, I've seen some good people do some pretty fucked up things in life, so. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually, that, that came out totally wrong. But uh, yeah, anyways, it's just, it's just one of those things where he's on a business trip and yeah, he's just like, his life will change. If he calls the police, which is the right thing to do, if you guys are ever in that situation, you goddamn won't call the police, all right? But he realizes that he's not gonna leave town. We, we know Vortex DNA is all over the scene. It's, it's a bad scene, it's a bad scene. But so yeah, that's what it is. It's basically, it's just a moral dilemma. He, like, that's, that's terrible that he even is contemplating, like, you know, you would like to think it's an automatic 911 call, or, or you'd like to think that, hey, can I drive you to the bathroom at the 7-Eleven or something, you know, I'm like, yeah. yeah. Maybe don't go into the woods there by yourself, yeah. but chivalry's dead in this movie, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me looking at him on that one was amazing. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Are you related to Jake Gyllenhaal? <laughs> <laughs> if I am, my mom has a lot of explaining to do. Well, on that note, <laughs> we're going to end the Q&A. Thank you so much, guys. For being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So I just want to take a moment now to thank everyone for being here on day two of the Open World Toronto Film Festival. We've come to our final film of the evening, which is crazy. Um, this year, um, it's the winner of the Best Feature Film category at the festival. It's Julian Ivanovich's Blondie Maxwell Ne Pas Jamais, or Blondie Maxwell Never Loses, um, coming to us from France. In a near future where justice has been fully liberalized, investigations are conducted by freelance detectives. Blondie Maxwell lives off of, a small, lives off of small investigations but dreams of getting her hands on Bollock, the most wanted man in the country, and the $3 million offered as the reward. While investigating the murder of a young woman, she arrests a culprit, all clues pointing to his guilt, but she will quickly realize that she is a victim of a much larger scheme. Enjoy the film. Thank you. If this is a video
this is gonna be awkward. Is it a video or a picture? Oh, okay. oh, okay. <laughs>